Ladies and gentlemen, we are just about to start today's last press conference. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Michael Chertov, Chairman and Co-Founder of the Chertov Group and former U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, and Mr. August Henning, former President of German Federal Intelligence Agency. Mr. Chertov, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here to uh, describe to you an initiative that GlobeSec is undertaking to look at intelligence reform in Europe, uh, particularly in light of recent terrorism events that we've experienced in Paris and in Brussels. Uh, this idea was, was uh, conceived late last year after the attacks in Paris, and it's an effort to look at the current state of intelligence collection and sharing in Europe uh, to evaluate what is working and what is in need of improvement and then to come up with some concrete recommendations about what can be done both within the member states of the European Union and across Europe as a continent and to better assure that we are able to protect uh, people in these countries based on good intelligence collection and good intelligence sharing. As many of you will know, uh, after the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States, uh, the U.S. took a very hard look at its own intelligence collection and sharing capabilities. And we discovered that in many cases we had information that was not being integrated and not being properly shared, and that was the result of that that there was uh, an opportunity for terrorists to carry out a, a devastating attack. So we did a reconstruction and a reform of the American intelligence establishment and uh, created a unified platform in which we could collect and share information, and that has been of enormous help in frustrating numerous terrorist uh, efforts over the past 15 years, uh, many of which, of course, never saw the light of day because we frustrated them before they got underway. So um, the opportunity here is to uh, look at the tragic events of the last six months and use that as an opportunity to engage in a similar exercise of examination here in Europe. Uh, the Globesec effort uh, is being led by a honorary steering committee of four individuals. I have the honor of chairing it. August Hani is one of the members. John Reed, uh, Lord Reed, former Home Secretary and Defense Secretary in the UK, is another member, as is Carl Bildt, who you know is the former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Sweden, and who you just saw a few moments ago um, uh, participating in a panel. We also are enlisting the assistance and advice of numerous other people with a strong background in intelligence, both in Europe and other parts of the world. And we're getting, of course, the excellent assistance of the staff here at GlobeSec in doing a good deal of research. So that uh, effort, I hope, is going to culminate in a report with some recommendations by the end of this year. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Like uh, Michael has mentioned, we have seen the terrorist attacks in Europe, uh, we have seen it in uh, Paris, we have seen it in Brussels, and I think that's a huge challenge for the law enforcement agencies in Europe, and it's a challenge, of course, for the intelligence uh, community all over Europe. And you remember afterwards there was always uh, a cry, a demand for better cooperation, better data, uh, sharing between the different authorities and I think uh, yes we have to meet uh, these uh, challenges we have to improve our cooperation but on the other side uh, we all have weaknesses in Europe every state uh, we have uh, heard uh, that the Belgians have been blamed on behalf of Brussels uh, we have some problems internally in Germany we have got nearly 300,000 uh, refugees in Germany without any registration. We have a lot of problems and therefore we should go ahead. We should go ahead in the practical cooperation and we uh, have to improve our capabilities. Uh, we have to improve our capabilities on behalf of personal resources, but this uh, lasts, this, this uh, needs time. But we have to improve our technical capabilities as well. And uh, we need uh, let me say more cooperation, more interoperational uh, possibilities in Europe 
and uh, therefore this committee uh, chaired by Michael is a very important one. Uh, we have had a very uh, valuable change of views today and yesterday and we are on the way and we try to make recommendations for the policy makers and for the law enforcement and intelligence community in Europe in order to enhance our cooperation and to enhance our capabilities. Thank you, gentlemen. So now is space for a question. start with the second question. Um, so we do do what we call undercover operations in the U.S. and usually what happens is uh, there's some informant or some piece of intelligence information uh, or perhaps something that occurred online that uh, tips off to the intelligence community, uh, to the law enforcement community, that there's somebody out there who is considering undertaking an act of terrorism or some other act of criminality. And then under our law, uh, we're entitled to introduce somebody to that individual to see whether in fact they want to carry something out. Now, if it turns out that they decide they don't want to do anything illegal, that's the end of the story. But in, in some cases we see that presented with the opportunity, that person will continue to pursue the desire to engage in an act of terrorism or other criminality. And that gives us the opportunity to let it play out without putting innocent people at risk. Because the one thing you don't want to do is watch somebody build a bomb and blow it up and kill innocent people. But if you can introduce an agent who will pretend to be building a bomb, but it's not functional, then it's possible to determine that someone is uh, conspiring to commit an act of terrorism without actually giving that person the tools that would allow them to carry it out. So we, we have found this to be a very useful um, a very useful law enforcement technique. Invariably, when the case goes to court, uh, the defense attorney argues that somehow this individual was really persuaded by the law enforcement authorities to carry out the, the act. Uh, but then the evidence is presented to the jury. And as long as the jury concludes that the individual defendant was in fact interested in doing a, a terrorist attack and had expressed some predisposition, then our law says that's a, a, a legitimate a law enforcement technique. The value of this is, um, you know, it, it, on television, it's exciting to see some, uh, uh, you know, a terrorist almost carry out a plot because it makes a lot of drama. But in real life, you're putting innocent people at risk by doing that. And this particular technique allows us to determine whether someone is interested in carrying out an attack, but without letting them actually carry it out and, God forbid, killing people. Um, on the first point, I would simply say, I think the vast majority of refugees who come in are not looking for anything other than a better life for themselves or to escape what is a terrible situation in Syria. Um, I think there are two challenges for Europe in this, and I say this respectfully. One is, um, you need to know who's coming in and where they're going. You can't simply have people come in and then disappear. Um, A, because there will be undoubtedly some individuals who exploit uh, the refugee migration as a way of getting into the uh, European continent to carry out a terrorist attack. And more generally, because if you don't find a way to ultimately deal with, 
with the refugees in an orderly way that's humane, but also make sure you understand exactly who is in, in, the, in the continent and where they're going, you run the risk over a period of time that people will become unhappy. And then that becomes a tool for recruiting terrorism. So, you know, it's important when you bring refugees in to treat them humanely, but also to bring them in so they can be assimilated, they can, be, they can learn the language, they can find work, so they actually develop a positive feeling about the society rather than becoming embittered and potentially then subject to recruitment. Yes, first of all, the running sources, uh, even in terrorist organizations, could be very useful and very valuable. And uh, during my active time, uh, we have been able really to investigate uh, whole terrorist organizations by running sources inside. That's one point. The other point is very risky because you could be involved in uh, criminal activities and so on. We have never carried out sting operations like our American colleagues have done. That's not our general practice uh, for different reasons. Uh, but running sources in terrorist organizations, I think, is a very valuable tool to prevent terrorist uh, attacks. To your second question, uh, I think a proper border control is a very important tool for internal security. And uh, we have been aware in Germany, the German government, that it was a special situation last year. But now I think there's a broad consensus that uh, every refugee who is hosted in Germany should be identified and it should be very clear who he, who he is and he needs uh, proper identity cards. Because otherwise you have a problem and uh, it's a practical problem. If you get, for example, a hint or if you get information that somebody may be dangerous but you don't know where he is and uh, is he really inside Germany, then you have a problem to deal with this uh, terrorist threat. Again, most of the refugees, and I can only uh, say the same like uh, Michael, uh, they don't have any problems and they are not causing any problems. But of course, if you have no border controls, it's uh, very attractive for terrorist organizations to uh, use this way for perpetrators, for activists, and we have seen in Brussels and in Paris, especially in Brussels, that some of the activists there have uh, uh, got access to uh, Europe, to Germany, via uh, these refugee routes. Therefore, we have to be very cautious, and in the future, I think we have to do our utmost that everybody who wants to enter Europe and to enter Germany and our states should be properly identified. Just, just for, I mean, because I, I also found that you said that you are not running your sting operation. Do you think it would be, okay, there are various reasons for it, uh, why we are not doing it, and I, I really don't know if, if anybody is doing it in, in, in Europe. If, 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 yeah, uh, but do you think that we should be running those more often, maybe like like the US. Is it is it is it a good is it a really good tool to to prevent terrorism? To I think our American colleagues have done it. They uh, think it is very uh, important, necessary, and they have been successful. We again we have a different practice in Germany. We haven't done it, and I think it's more or less the same practice in other European states as well. We have a different attitude to this issue. Thank you. Next question over there. Uh, we have the New Europe newspaper in Brussels. How concerned are you about the threat of a dirty bomb? And is it something that um, you know should concern Europe? And is it something that you would talk with uh, Russia as well, given that it's a nuclear power? Uh, we know that they snapped the. Um, Obama conference um, about nuclear, but they said they were ahead of the game. So I was wondering, like, if that would extend, like, with Russia and the U.S. and Europe working together for a dirty war. I guess they were dirty yeah, well, So let's separate two things because there's often a lot of confusion between a so-called dirty bomb and a, an actual nuclear weapon. Um, I think the conference in question was principally focused on proliferation of nuclear weapons. 
And there's no question if, if God forbid, an atomic bomb got in the wrong hands, um, that would be devastating. Uh, absolutely devastating as an attack. Um, I think that, and there was for a long period of time cooperation between the U.S. and Russia on making sure that nuclear weapons do not get out of the hands of the states that have nuclear weapons. And frankly, it's in everybody's interest to make sure that doesn't happen. Now, a dirty bomb is different. That's basically taking radioactive material and wrapping it around a conventional weapon. And um, that would be a very bad thing, but the scale of devastation would be considerably less. It's mainly what the explosion causes, and then the, the radioactive material has the effect of rendering that particular area almost uninhabitable for a period of years. So that's also a concern, although it's clearly different and of lesser magnitude than an actual nuclear weapon. I'm not going to get into the details of what a dirty, how a dirty bomb is made, but the nuclear material in a dirty bomb or the radioactive material is very different uh, than the kinds of material we worry about with an atomic bomb because there are different properties involved. But both are a matter of concern and um, you know, particularly with a dirty bomb, the most effective thing to do is to prevent people from getting a hold of that radioactive material, which means you have to make sure it's secured uh, wherever it's found. And there are many <coughs> legitimate uses for radioactive material, so you have to make sure it's well secured. Yes. May I add, uh, I, I, say, I share this view. Uh, the question, of course, is the use of non-conventional uh, tools and weapons by terrorist groups. That is uh, the major question. And uh, we have had some incidents in the 90s. I remember this Aoun sectarian group in Japan. Uh, and uh, we see this use of chemical weapons in Syria, civil war. Yes, it is a constant danger. Yes, we have to see this. And uh, we have seen this biological weapons in the US, in the US I remember, Michael. Therefore, yes, it is especially psychologically a, a very dangerous, dangerous tool in the hands of terrorist groups, and we have to be very cautious. Next question, please. Uh, if it's not other, any, okay, Mr. Matushak, if you want to, you can have questions. Uh, can you also elaborate on this initiative uh, with, with Globsec. In terms of uh, what should be basically uh, an outcome, it will be like a really like policy paper for, for politicians and and you are you are now of course ex official but but like a private citizen but <laughs> high ranking. Uh, so are you going to basically to communicate this initiative to your Successors, or in uh, so, in in terms of in, in terms of practicalities, uh, what this will bring? Well, I think yeah, as I said, I think what what we intend to produce is first of all a current survey of what the situation is with respect to intelligence uh, in the counterterrorism context in Europe. Um, I, uh, an identification based not just on our own views, but really interviewing a lot of people, some of whom are in government, some of whom are not in government, to get their sense of what the problems and challenges are, <clears throat> and then to use that as a basis to make some recommendations. And it'll be a public document, and the idea is it would be available to um, national legislators, national security officials, the general public, um, and could be a resource to be used as people begin to think about how do they, they make policy changes to deal with what I'm, I'm afraid is going to be a persistent threat of terrorism in this region for the foreseeable future. Yes, I think uh, there's a certain pressure on the policymakers in uh, Europe and for the heads of the intelligence and law enforcement agencies to go ahead to have a better cooperation, to improve the capabilities and maybe that our recommendations could help them to make the right decisions. Is it any other question? If not, thank you gentlemen for your time. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. We'll see you tomorrow.